So our, our final speaker of the day is Benjamin Weiss of the Hebrew University. <clears throat> so, um, it seems that I'm the representative of uh, dynamical systems in this meeting and uh, my talk is going to be perhaps slightly different from the talks that you've heard until now. Uh, I, I was going to say something, talk about uh, various kinds of random phenomenon that can be observed in deterministic systems. So, to begin with, the <coughs> let me describe the systems that I I'll, I'll take very simple deterministic systems so that we don't have uh, to deal with uh, too much complication. Here's a very simple deterministic system. It's the mapping from z to z squared in the complex plane. And <coughs> you iterate this system and you are interested in what happens to points as you iterate this mapping. <coughs> And it's very easy to see that the plane divides into two regions. Points outside the unit circle fly off to infinity, which is a fixed point. Points inside the unit circle fly into zero, which is a second fixed point. And if you're on the unit circle, you stay on the unit circle, and you have a map which is <coughs> opened up to the real line can be described by, maybe I should make that a little bigger, <coughs> which should be described by x goes into 2x, mod 1. So this is the graph of this mapping opened up onto the unit circle. <coughs> now, the point of my discussion of my talk is that we're going to see random behavior. And random behavior involves a sample space. I mean, this is the foundation of probability theory that we're familiar with from the time of Kolmogorov. So, if you take for your sample space here the unit interval equipped with Lebesgue measure, and if you take for your a function, random variable, which takes the value 0 here and the value 1 here, and if you look at the iterates of this mapping, what you're looking at are the digits of a point in the sample space. If you choose a point t here and expand the point t in base 2, <coughs> you get a sequence of coefficients, cn of t over 2 to the n. I'm sure this is all very familiar to you. <coughs> and then the values of cn of t are random variables defined on this sample space, and they correspond exactly to a sequence of random variables which are IID, independent, identically distributed, taking the values 0 and 1, each with probability a half. So this is perhaps the simplest sense in which a deterministic system can exhibit random behavior. You have a mapping, you iterate the mapping, you have a function defined on the space, you have a turn the space into a probability space, and then <coughs> you find that the sequence of observations that you make is exactly this ideal thing that uh, for the last few days, you've been hearing talks about people trying to approximate. How do you approximate actual coin tossings? So you could get exact coin tossings, of course, if you could 
choose a point on the unit interval at random. This is what uh, <coughs> this randomness would mean. Now, <coughs> the system here is a very simple one. If we go up one dimension already, uh, life gets more interesting. If we go up one dimension, we can... This falls off. Put it back on. If we go up one dimension, <coughs> we can look at a map of the torus. So we can now take the torus, which is R2 mod Z2, and take a simple mapping of the torus given by a matrix, say, 1, 1, 1, 0, <coughs> which maps the torus into itself. Now, here you have the same a measure. You have Lebesgue measure on the torus. <coughs> you can start by asking a very simple question. Can you find a, I mean, if I now think of this as the torus, can I somehow partition the torus into two sets of measure a half a half so that if I sample a point on the torus and look at its itinerary under the iterations of this mapping, this T, which maps the torus to itself, can I find some partition into two sets, A0 and A1, so that the itinerary of a point x will be iid a half a half. You might ask this question. And it turns out that the answer is no. You can't get this much randomness here. You can't get this much randomness here because <coughs> of a notion of entropy. So let me <coughs> put that here. <coughs> when you have a probability space and a mapping from the space into itself, which preserves the measure, the probability P. I, I didn't emphasize you really that. Meant this, this matrix? Excuse me? You really meant this matrix? Yes, yes, I meant this matrix. I think I meant this matrix. Uh, I think, I mean, if I didn't make a mistake, I think this is okay. Excuse me? Excuse me? What is the... Excuse me? It's not orientation preserved. No, this happens not to orient it. It preserves the measure. It has the term in it minus one. It's, okay. it's okay. I think it's, it's okay. Uh, I mean, to preserve the measure, you need the Jacobian. I mean, to, to be one, and I think the Jacobian is, is fine. Okay. So, <clears throat> whenever you have such a transformation which preserves the probability, there is a quantity associated to this called the entropy of the trans of tau with respect to this probability measure, which is a number between zero and infinity. This is the Shannon entropy for a stationary process for this IID, it's log 2. So the entropy of this sequence is log 2. And you can compute the entropy of this transformation. This was done a long time ago. And it's log lambda. So the entropy here 
of 1110 is log <coughs> of the absolute value of the eigenvalue which is greater than 1, which turns out to be, I believe, this. So I think this number is less than 2, and so <coughs> you can't achieve log 2. <coughs> However, if you take the square of the matrix, you double the entropy, and you can ask the same question again, and now the answer is yes. Yes, you can partition the torus into two sets, A0 and A1, so that, excuse me? I, I want a one here. Yes, thank you. You square the matrix correctly. <laughs> and now you get twice the entropy, and you can partition into two sets, A0 and A1, so that itineraries behave exactly like <coughs> uh, 0, 1, a half, a half, I, I. The proof of that depends on a, a theorem that of Sinai going back to around 1963 or 4, something like that, uh, which I can't describe now. And in fact, I'm not going to pursue this kind of randomness in deterministic systems. It's not so hard to give uh, one talk or several talks uh, exploring other deterministic systems where you can find this kind of randomness. <coughs> I want to focus today on another way that you can see randomness in deterministic systems. And for that purpose, I'm going to go back to <coughs> the very first example, namely this model. And I'm going to go back to just sequences of zeros and ones. And <coughs> but I don't want to use the whole sample space in order to see my randomness. Now, <clears throat> I eventually will want to talk about, <clears throat> so let's put that out of the way. <clears throat> the kind of random system that I would like, want to find in that very simple system of mapping z to z squared is a Poisson point process. We'll take the simplest one on <coughs> the line 0 infinity. This may not be familiar to everybody, so let me spend a couple of minutes telling you what this is. So. Here's the line, and a random distribution of points on the line is some countable subset of the line. <coughs> so we take countable subsets, countable subsets of R plus as our omega. So omega consists of countable subsets. There's some sigma field which describes what kind of events we can measure. And I'll soon tell you the kind of events we would like to measure. And there's a probability which I will also tell you. So the measurable events 
will include for any um, finite collection of intervals i1 up to ik disjoint will have random variables xi1, xi2, xik, which count xi sub j is the number of evaluated at omega is the number of points in omega intersect i j. So we have this random set. Omega is an instance of this random set. This, these variables are mappings from ec, omega into the natural numbers together with zero, and you simply count how many points there are in the set. I want these to be measurable with respect to sigma, and I want their probabilities to be <coughs> given the joint distribution should be as follows. <coughs> So the probability that xi is equal to some number m is equal to e to the minus i times i to the m divided by m factorial, where i is the length. <coughs> and in addition, I want these variables to be I, K are independent. So this characterizes the Poisson point process. It's a, a distribution on random subsets of points so that <coughs> when you count how many you have in disjoint intervals, you have independence. And the distribution of each of these random variables is Poisson with parameter equal to the length of the interval. Are there any questions about this? <coughs> you can describe all of these random variables in terms of x sub t. This is the way it's often written, which is in the notation I've just given x zero t. And this is simply the number of points <coughs> in the interval zero t. Okay. okay so this ends the di digression on explaining <coughs> what a Poisson point process is. Yes, question. Okay, it doesn't appear here because this is a shorthand for the probability of the set of omega in omega such that xi of omega is equal to m. This is the event that the random variable takes the value m. My sample space consists of all of the possible countable subsets. So omega is a countable subset. This is what the sample space is. It's like you toss a coin and you get an H or a T, the sample space is HT. You toss a coin N times, the sample space is strings of N sequences, H and T. That has two to the N points in it. This is a very big sample space. It's <coughs> a subset of the countable product of R. And <clears throat> I'm telling you 
what kind of functions to find on that space I demand to be measurable. And then you close these under the process of forming a sigma algebra. This fully describes the sigma that I need. And I'm telling you what the distribution is. This doesn't define the probability. You actually have to construct. I'm describing the space. I'm not actually constructing it for you. That takes a little bit of work. It takes about two hours in a course on probability theory. Not, so, not very difficult. It's the easiest continuous time process to construct. It's much easier to construct than Brownian motion. <clears throat> okay. But feel free to ask questions. I mean, we have plenty of time, and I have no... <clears throat> okay. Okay, now I go back to sequences of zeros and ones. And I return to the very first lecture of the meeting at which Ben Green briefly said what a normal number is. Okay, so in some sense, this is the beginnings of modern probability theory. So I'll repeat the definition, a normal number in base 2 <coughs> is a number t such that when you expand it in base 2, the sequence x1, x2, and so on has all k blocks <coughs> in 0, 1 to the k occurring with frequency 2 to the minus k. <coughs> okay, now <coughs> here are a couple of examples of normal numbers. Here's one example. Okay, there's one example. Uh, ah, I should add some dots. I always talk about infinite sequences. In case you're not sure how to continue, then I'll put in some commas, and if I didn't make a mistake, now you should understand how to continue. I mean, the commas don't really belong there. They're just to tell you how I'm constructing the sequence. So this is just the numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on in base 2, written one after another. <coughs> The first to observe this was Chamfer now. <coughs> here's, another <coughs> here's another one, but now I'm going to write it not in, you should express it in base 2, but I, I, I'll get confused if I try to do that. So 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. 17, 19, and so on. <coughs> I'll say a few words about how you show that the Champernow number is normal. This is, was <coughs> a result of Copeland and Erdős. And you can use other sequences takes a little more work, but these are sort of simple examples of normal numbers. Now, <coughs> uh, where do I go? Ah, okay. Maybe I do some exercises. So, push him up. Push him up. Yeah. And then pull down somebody. Uh, 
So about 10 years ago, uh, in connection with a talk that Zev Rudnik gave in uh, Jerusalem, uh, Yuval Peres, who was still in Jerusalem at the time, and I uh, started thinking a bit about <coughs> further properties of randomness that a typical sequence can have. And <coughs> What we, the concept that uh, I'll start by introducing now is something that goes a little beyond normality, and I'll call this metanormal. So a number <coughs> is metanormal in base two if. OK. Now I need some <coughs> notation. So omega k will be the k strings. <coughs> so a number, which is represented by a sequence, uh, t, c1, c2, and so on, <coughs> if the random variables, ah, I forgot something here. On this space, I put uniform measure. So this is now a probability space. Very simple, discrete probability space with two to the k elements. Now, I define the random variables y sub k on omega k. by y sub k, remember t is fixed, y sub k of omega is the number of indices up to 2 to the k such that xi, xi plus 1, xi plus k minus 1 equals omega. <coughs> oh, maybe I make that bigger. So I'm counting yk counts the number of times this particular k block appears in the first two to the k places. So what's the probability of it occurring at a particular place if this number was chosen to random? It's 1 over 2 to the k. So the expected value of, that you would expect of yk is 1. If I were to sort of choose the Xs at random, but this is not what I'm doing. Yk is, uh, may take different kinds of values depending on t. There's a t here which I've suppressed. <coughs> it appears here. This depends on t. So a number is metanormal. <laughs> in base 2 if for all m the probability on this sample space so i'll write down here p omega k that y k of omega is equal to m converges to e to the minus 1 divided by m factorial So for normality, what does normality mean? Normality means that you look at finite sample spaces which are increasing, and you define random variables, which is the frequency of one block, the frequency of two blocks, and so on. And for each one of those, you want convergence to a certain number, 1 over 2 to the k. For metanormal, you look up to 2 to the k plus k minus 1, but you are computing some very rough statistics for the k blocks. So is this definition clear? 
Now, I'll write down two theorems. <coughs> yeah, okay, before I write some theorems, I maybe should make a remark. Okay. Question? Speak up. I, I... Did you take the limit? So, uh, in the limit, k tends to infinity? Yes, k tends to infinity. This is the probability omega washes out, m is fixed, the only variable is k. The limit as k goes to infinity is, is this number. Now, metanormal means somehow beyond normality. And for those who are slightly bored at this point, you could take as an exercise to take that chamfer noun number that I've written down up there and check that it's not metanormal. Wait, so this omega again, it's in count. This omega it doesn't count anything. This omega is a point. Omega is a generic symbol for a point in the sample space. The sample spaces change. Now, omega is an element of 0, 1 to the k. It's just a k block. For each k block, you count how often it occurs. That gives you a random variable. <clears throat> the probability that yk is 0 is simply the number of k blocks that don't occur at all divided by 2 to the k. Omega disappears. This is a number on the left-hand side. The left-hand side is a number. Is it clear that metanormal is normal? Wait. <laughs> I first point out as an exercise that normal need not be metanormal. <clears throat> the first theorem that makes this interesting is every meta normal number is normal. Every talk should have some proof. I will soon, after I state a couple of more things, I'll come back and I'll try to explain why this is true. This is not very hard. It's sort of in some sense, not much more difficult than proving the Champer noun or the copeland erdős numbers. It's something of that kind that I... Uh, so I've just told you that <coughs> the Champer noun number is not metanormal. Maybe there are no metanormal numbers. I mean, if there weren't any, then obviously I wouldn't be giving this talk. Uh, so, <clears throat> so, let me define something just a little bit stronger so that the next theorem that I write will be a little more impressive. So, using the same notation, <clears throat> a number is Poisson generic. If now <coughs> I allow myself the luxury that you don't have when you work with PowerPoint and so on is to recycle what you've already done. So I have some expression here, and <coughs> I will introduce another parameter, lifting the k upstairs and putting a parameter s down here. And this counts the number of i, not up to 2 to the k, but up to s times 2 to the k. So s is a real number. So 
the sample space remains, this sample space with two to the k points, but now instead of defining simply one random variable, I define a whole stochastic process. Y, S, this defines an entire stochastic process. For every S, it gives me a random variable. <coughs> Is Poisson generic if Y, S, K converges as K goes to infinity in distribution to <coughs> the Poisson point process? So you get the probability distribution of the Poisson point process out of these finite sample spaces that are built out of a single number. If that happens, then you say the number uh, T or C1, C was probably a bad choice for the variable. This, you remember, depends on the C. Poisson generic if this converges to a Poisson point process. So that's theorem one, and here's theorem two. <coughs> Almost every, in the sense of Lebesgue, number is Poisson. <coughs> so Poisson uh, metanormal numbers and Poisson generic numbers are not only normal, they enjoy more properties of random sequences. Uh, one problem that has troubled us for many years is that, I'll write this down as a problem, <coughs> problem, give an explicit construction of a metanormal or Poisson generic. What, mean, what means explicit? What means explicit? Uh, somebody said at some point earlier, I forget which of the speakers, that when I see it, I'll know if it's explicit or not. I mean, explicit surely does not, okay, let, let, let me be, okay, I, I have to, I, I have to tell the, I have to explain somehow what this is, what is involved here. So, <clears throat> Champernoun first gave this explicit construction uh, around 1930 something claiming that this is the first example of a, an explicit. Uh, but in, I think, around 1916 or 17, Sierpinski published a paper in which he constructed an absolutely normal number. Absolutely normal is one which is normal in every base. And what Sierpinski did was he took the proof of Borel and at every point somehow, he says, he made choices. I mean, Borel is showing that something has measure one. He does this with a sequence of steps getting bigger and bigger. And Sierpinski says, okay, at this point, we will choose you know, the first point in this interval and so on. And so he follows the proof of Borel and constructs a number which is, okay, this is not what I mean by explicit. I mean, uh, later on, Turing wrote a paper in which he gave a computable description of the null set in the complement, uh, which captures all of the non-absolutely normal numbers. 
So that's also for me not. I mean, for people like Peter, this is also not an explicit construction because what Peter wants is he wants a number. He wants somebody to say something like, this is a normal number. Okay. But for the moment, this is beyond uh, what we know how to do. And what I mean by explicit is some construction of a sequence, which I can see. I mean, construct a sequence with these properties. <coughs> Okay, so I said something about proving theorem one, but I should also tie this up with the torus and put another problem on the board, probably a little more advanced, but no matter. <coughs> <I can't. coughs> a little more advanced, on the other hand, something that I believe is in reach. So I was telling you about toral automorphisms and telling you how you could also see IID processes there where you used for the sample space the Lebesgue space. Now, people have found Poisson, I, I'm not giving you a, a, a big survey, lots of people have written about various kinds of random processes which emerge in deterministic systems. Uh, I'm <coughs> not giving you a survey of the literature. <clears throat> but I do want to point out a way in which you can see the Poisson point process emerging out of the behavior of a single point under the iterates of a toral automorphism. Now here you don't have some nice block structure when you iterate the map. So what I propose to do is the following. <clears throat> you fix a point, you, you fix a transformation. So T maybe is this transformation of the two torus. And you fix a point as before. So you fix some x naught in the two torus. And now <clears throat> you divide the torus into <laughs> k squared into k squared little squares, so divide into k squares of the size 1 over k. And you take for your sample space, omega k is now <coughs> Omega k is going to be um, 1, 2 up to k squared. Just this set. How do I write that? Here. And the probability is now 1 over k squared. And we have fixed a point, and we define as before y k of S at omega. This is <coughs> the number of I between 0 and S times. We scale now by k squared such that T to the I of X0 lands in <coughs> the square omega. So this is S1, that's S omega if omega is the label of that square. So you look at the orbit of x naught, you follow it up to xk squared, and you count how many points land in that square. So the theorem is that almost every point 
x naught, y k s will converge in distribution to a Poisson point process. As k goes to infinity. So the point x naught is somewhere here. Okay. Y has become embroidered. I have room for one more. This is for all s. This is as a point process. So this means simultaneously what it means, what you have to verify is that for disjoint intervals, these random, if you, you can define for an interval the number of points in the interval by just taking y at one end point minus y at the other end point. The difference gives you the number of points in the interval. These random variables, joint distribution, for disjoint intervals converge to the joint distribution of the Poisson process that I've written down up there. I didn't write down the formula, but you just multiply those probabilities. If you take a k-tuple, just a, I wrote independence, just multiply these. And that's what you have to verify here. Actually, it suffices to verify something less. You just have to verify the empty probabilities because of certain properties that these processes have. I, I'm not going <coughs> to sort of not going to get into, uh, try to get into the proof of this. Um, so this theorem we know for so-called hyperbolic toral automorphisms. That means all eigenvalues have a modulus which is not equal to 1. It's probably true for non-hyperbolic ergodic automorphisms as well, but our proof doesn't work. Uh, what we use about hyperbolic toral automorphisms is Markov partitions. So <coughs> this is a way in which uh, slightly, uh, an easier way to see randomness for toral automorphisms. You construct Markov partitions for them, and you see Markov processes. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to try to sort of explain this, but I'll state there's another problem. So this is maybe problem one and problem two. Extend to non-hyperbolic toral automorphisms. So, what? I have no reason to doubt it. I mean, no, I, I, I yes, question. Choose. Yes. Then you think it should produce the random sequence at random. What do you mean by choosing a transformation at random? From some, like each entry from 1 to 100 independently. OK. For 2 by 2 matrices, <coughs> for 2 by 2 matrices, if you choose integer entries, then 
One of two things can happen. You might have eigenvalues which are roots of unity. If you have an eigenvalue which is a root of unity, this should not be true. If not, then if the determinant is one, it's true, because then it's hyperbolic for two by two matrices. So you don't have to choose them at random. It's simply true for all two by two matrices with determinant plus or minus one, as long as you don't have roots of unity as, you, you, you have to rule out just a few, uh, so for two by two integer matrices. If you take non-integer matrices, then you have to explain how you define them on they're unipotent. You, you, I say you are not allowed to have roots of unity among the eigenvalues. So unipotent is bad. What? non hyperbolic ergodic. I'm sorry. I, yeah, ergodic toral automorphisms. No, no. I mean, if it's not ergodic, I, I mean, this, there's no reason for this to be true. So ergodic means no roots of unity among the eigenvalues. Yeah. OK, so that's much weaker than saying there are no eigenvalues with modulus on the unit circle. Excuse me? No, no, no. No. I mean, the proof, I mean, uh, the proof of theorem one is elementary, uh, elementary, modulo, the weak law of large numbers, which is behind everything. Uh, the proof of theorem two is. Uh, <laughs> For the Poisson that almost every. Which one? The one on the toral automorphism. For the toral automorphism, what you need to do is you have to first prove a, an annealed version where you sample also from, you sample a point at random, not only. Uh, people have proved Poisson limit theorems for return times to small sets. When you return to a small set and you use for your sample space the Lebesgue measure on the little set which is renormalized and look at returns to that set, you get a Poisson distribution for the returns. This has been done beginning uh, in the 80s or 90s and for toral automorphisms. And then you have to take such a proof and verify that you can go from the annealed version to the quenched version. And for that, you need some concentration of probability. So I mean, that's in sort of two words how you prove these things. They're not very deep, but there's no number theory. Uh, no number theory involved in it. <coughs> uh, Yes, I keep promising that I'm going to prove something, and I, okay, I should make good on one of the promises. Uh, okay, so. What do you know when you know that a number is metanormal? <clears throat> well, what I claim is that the first thing you know is that for large k, for large k, <clears throat> uh, 1 minus epsilon fraction of the sequence x1 up to x2 to the k is covered. So this is for a metanormal number. 1 minus epsilon fraction of this is covered 
by k blocks that do not appear more than more than some constant number of times which depends on epsilon. So where does this come from? This simply comes from the fact that the Poisson random variable, when you compute its expectation, you get one. So if you truncate this, you get something close to one, and that fills up most of the space. For most of the space, the probability that yk is less than m epsilon is greater than 1 minus epsilon. So that's what you can easily verify. And then <coughs> all you need to know is that the probability, <coughs> OK, now we fix. I have to check normality. so. I have to check frequencies, so check the frequencies of blocks of length 10. The probability that a block of length 10 doesn't occur with frequency approximately 1 over 1024 in a K block is little o of 1 over K. <clears throat> this is all that you need. You know that it goes to zero by the law of large numbers. And I mean, K now is getting large. I fix this 10 to the 24. So there are very, very few of the k blocks which are not good for you. Now, if it's little o, this is a constant. So the bad ones, even if they occurred m epsilon times, can't cover too much of the string between 1 and 2 to the k. So if you put those observations together, what you'll discover is that as soon as you're close enough, as soon as k is large enough so that you're close to being this Poisson distribution, when you go out from x1 to x2 to the k, most of this string will be covered by k blocks where the internal frequency of blocks of length 10 is approximately 1 over 10 to the 24. So now you compute the frequency across the whole string, and you see that it's correct. I mean, this is what's behind the fact that the Champernow number is normal. How do you prove the Champernow number is normal? You look between, you look at the point where you've written out all of the blocks of length k, this is not at 2 to the k, but at k times 2 to the k. And you look at frequencies there, and there are blocks which are bad, and you cross them out, but they have a low frequency because of the weak law of large numbers. So you see that the Champernow number is fine. And, uh, and a similar argument shows you that metanormal will imply normality. <coughs> the problem with getting uh, with constructing metanormal numbers is that in this range between two, 1 and 2 to the k, 2 to the k, 2 to the k plus 1, you also have to worry about longer blocks because this, these occupy a, a fixed fraction of the next sequence, and then you're checking blocks of length k plus 1. So you have to somehow control not only and you have to control overlapping blocks, and which you don't have to control for the normal numbers. So this is a kind of rough sketch of uh, how you prove theorem 1. I said a few words about the proof of theorem 2, but that's sort of really more technical. <coughs> I would rather advertise 
some more properties of uh, Poisson, uh, of metanormal numbers, I mean, which may be more suitable for pseudorandomness, they enjoy more randomness properties than just regular normal numbers. And this is something that I... <coughs> so here, maybe uh, some further properties. So for the first, let me go back for a moment to normal numbers and tell you about some properties of normal numbers. So if x is normal and you sample, say, xd, x2d, x3d, and so on, you sample along an arithmetic sequence, you get again a normal number. You sample along d times n, you get a normal number. Again. This is an old theorem due to Hewitt and Zuckerman a newer theorem, but still old, is suppose you sample not along an arithmetic sequence, but we've seen these before, um, alpha, x2 alpha, x3 alpha, and so on. You sample along a bracket sequence, like that, where alpha is any irrational, any number, not necessarily rational. You also get a normal number again. <laughs> And you can replace these sequences by fancier sequences, but you can't replace it by something like the squares. You can't say anything about all normal numbers along such a sequence, because this sequence has density zero. And if you took a normal number and arbitrarily set all of these to equal zero, you wouldn't change the normality. So normality is not sensitive to a change along a zero density sequence. Now, <coughs> this is no longer true for a Poisson generic number, but for metanormal, even. So, <coughs> If you take a sequence n1, n2, n3 that grows slowly enough, what slowly enough means is that the gaps when ni is between 2 to the k and 2 to the k plus 1 are much smaller than k. So imagine a sequence growing monotonically, with the differences growing monotonically, like with the squares, but it grows slowly, so that when you reach this area, you're skipping, but you're skipping by something that's much smaller than k. Square root k, or something like that. Then, then, if x1, x2, and so on is metanormal, xn1, xn2, xn3, and so on is normal. So could you take the time Excuse me? Uh, you know how they grow. I mean, I'm not sure they satisfy this. I mean, no, but you didn't say it's no, 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 no. I just said that this is sufficient. No, 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 no. I, I know nothing about 
Uh, may work for prime. I, I don't know. This is a, a good question. The primes are just short of this because they grow not, they grow like k. They grow on the average like log k, and I, uh, and I can't deal with that, of course. So, <coughs> uh, yeah, there. There are more properties, I guess, but it's been a long day. I think I'll stop here, and we have some time for questions. Are there questions? Yes. Explain again the condition slowly, not slowly. Okay. Okay, so that condition means the following. Um, I want ni plus 1 minus ni to be greater than or equal to ni plus 2 minus ni plus 1, less than or equal to. I want the gaps to be monotonic, and I want that when I get to 2 to the k, you should see more than, right? I want that the gap size, OK, so for ni between 2 to the k and 2 to the k plus 1, I want ni plus 1 minus ni to be little o of k. So to be much smaller than k. This is the condition. For such sequences, I'm sure there's probably, you can probably weaken this monotonicity assumption to some extent. I don't think you can do things completely arbitrarily, but I, 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 I didn't check this too carefully. I mean, for this, I'm sure, this I'm sure works. I mean, this surprised me a little bit that you could sample on a zero density sequence and guarantee normality. This is a, that was a slight surprise to me. Another question? Yes. Concerning the torus of the morphisms? Yes. Can you the same thing for nonlinear torus of the Okay. So, in principle, I mean, I, I didn't work this out, but in principle, for Anosov diffeomorphisms, where you have Markov partitions, you have absolutely continuous invariant measures. If you would partition into equal, into nice sets of equal size, in principle, this should work. But I say in principle, there's technical work uh, that needs to be done there, which I certainly haven't done. Yes. This sampling number, I don't know. I, that's an easier question than what I've asked. And this is, uh, this is a good sort of, uh, sort of warm-up problem for constructing Poisson normal. Yes, I didn't. I, 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 we did this, most of this work about 10 years ago. And uh, having, excuse me? Yes, as Ev knows, we never wrote it up because he knows that when we do, he'll get a copy. So <laughs> he's our watchman, and uh, he's still waiting for us to write this up, and so am I. And, uh, <laughs> and in the meantime, Yuval, I mean, the last time I made an attempt at this, uh, the day before I arrived at Microsoft, Yuval became manager, and for the next 10 days, he was swamped with managerial duties. And so it's... We've had some trouble getting this written up. But, so I haven't thought about this question that you asked, Tim, but it's a very nice one, and I, I don't know. It should certainly be easier than constructing a Poisson, than constructing a metanormal number. But I don't know how much easier. 
Yes. Which other properties do these Poisson generic numbers Well, here's one, for example. The various kinds of things that you can't do quantitatively for normal numbers, you can do for Poisson because of this property that I was describing there. For example, suppose you wanted to know how far do you have to go in order to see all the k-blocks. So for normal numbers, you can't say anything. For metanormal numbers, I can produce for you a sequence, LK, and guarantee that for every metanormal number, number x, there exists a k naught, which depends on the number. And then for all k greater than k naught in the string x1 up to x2 to the k, all 2 to the k blocks, I'm sorry, LK. All 2 to the k blocks appear. So I can guarantee a rate. I can also, the way I've described how you can find the Poisson point process uh, using other kinds of statistics on these sample spaces, I could construct Brownian motion. I mean, this is a... But it, it, the fact is that the moment you know that most of the k blocks up to 2 to the k are typical, you can make quantitative statements that they're not possible just for normality, because normality comes equipped with no rate. This is the difference between the, the notion. Any further questions? Okay. Yes, thank you.